Welcome again to Bloomer Academy. Thank you so much for joining us today, where we are talking about Imports 101. Joining us today is Alex Gerchev, one of our managers over in our customer support department. Um, I love having our support folks come into Academy. If you've ever chatted in or called in or emailed support, you may have talked to Alex, you may have talked to one of his folks before, so I'm very excited to have him here. Welcome, Alex. Hey, thank you. Uh, howdy, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, exciting to see all the weather reports roll in. Um, it's like it's 83, but it's like a sticky 83. So I was watering the plants earlier. It's not it's not great, <laughs> but it's <laughs> not 100 like someone said. Absolutely. Well, I know we have a lot to cover today, so take it away, Alex. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and just grab the screen here. And we'll start the slideshow. All right. Yes, my name is Alex. I'm a manager in customer support here with Bloomerang. Um, glad to be here. I'm excited to talk about imports with y'all um, outside of. Sorry, yes. Alex, well, I can see your Slack is what I can see. Oh, whoops. <laughs> okay, well, let's um, let's try that's, that again, huh? That's technology for you. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yeah, thanks for. <laughs> There we go. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> the Slack the Slack would be chaotic and confusing for y'all and not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, excited to talk about imports um, with y'all today. I remember early on when I started in Bloomerang, imports was one of those things that was um, was intimidating. It was big and hard. Um, but once you figure out the formula, right, um, and get a grasp on the way that imports work, it, it kind of all clicks together, right? And so excited to work with you all on this today. Um, if you've got a pending import, or a bunch of data that you need to import into your database, you know, feel free to crack that open. Um, we'll go through some really practical steps of running an import um, and how to make sure that your file is ready to go before you import that data in there. So we're in Imports 101. Today we'll start with just some general notes on importing um, as a process. And then I think a, the bulk of our time will be um, in creating um, new, actually running the imports, right? Um, getting your files set up in Google Sheets or Excel, and then the import process into Bloomerang, right? So if you've got data from another, another system, if you've got uh, manual data that needs to be entered. The, the import system is a lot more efficient than going in one by one and entering in that information. So yeah, goal today is to really walk you through how to run an import and how to make sure your files are good to go. So first things first, like why would someone run an import, right? Um, there are a ton of reasons that an import can be helpful. Again, the best way to think about an import is it's a, a great way to update or add data on mass to Bloomerang, right? There's a handful of um, stipulations with that, but anytime that you would have to do something repetitive as far as data entry goes, usually an import can get you there more quickly. So for instance, if you're adding a bunch of new constituents in bulk, right? Import is a great tool for that. If you're wanting to update data on existing constituents, um, one of the functionalities of an import is to update um, existing constituents in your database with new data, whether that's contact information, um, custom field information, et cetera. You can create a bunch of transactions you know, from a processor. Maybe you've got a processing system that um, is collecting your donations externally and you want to import that all into Bloomerang. Maybe you've collected donations in person and you want to um, create record of all of those. Import's great for that. Maybe you want to log in attendance via an interaction import. Um, or again, maybe you want to move data from another system into Bloomerang. Imports are great for, for all of these sorts of tasks. Um, worth noting here off the top, like we mentioned, um, that an import can and cannot do a handful of things. Um, 
there, there's a few stipulations as far as what imports can touch and what they cannot touch. And we'll make sure to cover that well here off the top um, so that we're well informed about what we can and can't do. So imports can create individual and organizational constituents. It can create new ones, right? It can also update existing constituents. Um, this is the, the differing thing between constituents and timeline entries, as we'll mention here in a moment. But Imports can update existing constituents. It can't update existing timeline entries like interactions, donations, notes, etc. cetera. Um, it can, of course, create new donations, interactions, and notes, but again, cannot update ones that are existing. Import can't create relationships or households, some of these things that require a touch of more than one part of the database, and import's not quite able to make those sorts of changes. It can't, again, update existing donations, interactions, or notes. It can't create um, some more complex donation types, such as pledges, recurring donations, or soft credits. It also can't mass delete data. We've got some different types of tools, some new um, bulk um, edit functionality in the data tools area of the database, which can accomplish some of these features uh, or some of these tasks in a way that imports can't, but we're going to focus on the imports tool today. So the first step right to making sure that your import is ready to go is setting up that import file. There's a link here in the slides of um, our primary import documents. Um, we've got some great resources on this, which I will probably be referring to because they are, yeah, super helpful and really handy to refer to. Um, the most important thing when getting your import ready is making sure that that file is set up correctly. Here are a handful of things um, that are important to keep in mind when you're getting that file figured out. Um, first of all, making sure that we split individuals and organizations into separate files. Um, in the imports process, there's going to be um, two different ways in which individuals and organizations are imported. So you'll want to break those up into distinct files. Um, you'll want to separate some of these fields, which commonly in other data exports get lumped together. Um, namely, the different name fields need to all be in their own column, right? First name, middle name, last name need to have their own columns rather than one name field. We'll go through some tips to make that happen here later. Same thing with address fields, right? Separate fields for the street address, the city, the state, the zip code, et cetera, rather than them all being in one big column. Another note here for Bloomerang data is to specify those fields, especially the, um, the contact information type fields. For instance, um, you know, state isn't enough. It has to specify which type of address that is, right? Home state, for instance. Same thing with phone number. Um, note that there is a 10,000 row and two megabyte file limit for an import. If you've got over 10,000 rows of data in your import file, you know, congratulations. You've got so much data and that's going to make your reporting great but you'll have to split it up into multiple files. Um, this, the system wouldn't be able to handle over 10,000 rows in one import or over two megs. Um, and then the last thing, of course, is to make sure to save this as a CSV file. That's easy enough in Excel or Sheets, whichever spreadsheet system you use, just save as and choose .csv. Um, and this will be a common refrain throughout the, um, the course today, but you can always send your import file into support, support at bloomerang.com or through live chat. Um, yeah, my team and I are happy to help. The, the thing with imports, right, because it's largely an irreversible process, never hurts to have us take a look at it um, and make sure that things are situated correctly. We can help um, guide you in the right direction if there's anything that needs to be adjusted before you run that import in. Let's talk about required fields. So in the same way that when you're manually entering data in Bloomerang, certain fields are required, right? Whenever you're entering a donation, you can't actually save that transaction until you enter in a date amount in a fund, for instance. The same is going to be true when running an import. There's certain 
required fields that have to be included in your import file for those, um, those data items to exist. For constituents, individuals, right, we need a first name and a last name. That's it. Organization, all we need is organization name. Of course, any further data beyond that is great, but all you need to get the import successful is first and last name. For a donation, we mentioned this already, but we need the date, amount, and fund included in that import file. Um, again, any further data is great. Interaction is date, subject, purpose, and channel. We'll talk a little bit more in depth about what those fields are, but in short, the date is the date of the interaction. Subject is the content or the name of it. Um, your purpose is exactly that, the purpose of the interaction, usually things like into, um, cultivation or um, things along that line. And then the channel is the manner in which you had the interaction in person, email, et cetera. For notes, you need date and note. Um, also important here that you know you can import data into custom fields in your imports, but um, it is required that any of those custom fields would need to be created before you run that import, right? Um, something that is kind of a rule of thumb when running an import is anything that you wish to add to your database, any data you want to um, import in, those fields or values ought to already be created in your database before you run the import. So if, for instance, you know, you're adding as simple as like a fund to your donations, right? That fund has to first be added into your database before you can import. Um, same thing with custom fields. If you're going to add data to a custom field, that field has to be created first in your database. Here's a few spreadsheet tips. We'll see these in action here shortly, but um, some of the most common things that we run into in support um, when setting up an import file does kind of take us out of Bloomerang and into the world of spreadsheets, which, you know, speaking from experience is a big scary world, <laughs> at least in my mind. Um, and so here's a few things that we've learned that will help ease the burden of getting those files set up correctly. First of all, when you're importing values into a pick multiple custom field, right? So if it's a it's a custom field that can have multiple values selected in that particular field, you can import more than one value into that, but you've got to use that pipe character to separate the values. That is found on most keyboards above the enter key. Um, if you shift and then click that button above the enter key, um, that is gonna give you that pipe character. Um, and that's how you're gonna separate multiple values and pick multiple custom field. Handy tip there. Um, you can use the split text to columns command to easily split full name columns to first name and last name, for instance. Um, this is something that's common too, right? If you've got John Smith all in one cell, um, I'll, I'll show this in action here in a moment too, but using that split text to columns will allow you to easily parse those out into separate ones. Another common thing is Excel or Sheets likes to eliminate any leading zeros in numbers. Um, so namely in a zip code, if you've got a zip code that starts with zero, um, it can be pesky in that it takes the zero away. By putting an apostrophe in front of that zero though, it tells the system to retain that zero and make it a valid zip code. Um, we'll talk about duplicate matching here um, really quickly. It, it, when running an import, right, the system is going to look for any existing constituents that uh, may already be in your database that map to um, the, the data in your import file. So the, the system is going to look at a few things to determine if a, if a match already exists, right? Um, if you have an account number for the existing constituent, that's going to be the most direct way to ensure that there is a match, right? Um, I'll, I'll talk about how to get that account number out of your database shortly, but that's going to create an exact immediate match. If you don't have account numbers, um, a matching name isn't quite enough for the system to identify. Of course, it's possible that you have more than one unique person with the same name in your database. So, 
you will need matching first and last name and then an additional one of the following um, contact information fields, whether that's email address, phone number, or mailing address. If name and one of those things matches, it will map the data onto your existing constituent rather than creating a new one. So when you're importing your data, right, um, a couple best practices here that we recommend, if, especially if you've got a large file, definitely recommend importing a test or a sample of your file before running it in. You know, you can create a copy and just save the top five rows or so and run that in, see how it behaves. Um, and then after importing that test, make sure to run a spot check um, on those constituents you updated or imported and making sure that it's all looking like you're expecting. Um, and again, you can always chat into support, always send us an email and we are happy to help you through the process. Okay, so now, now we're gonna get into the meat and potatoes of our session. I've got some sample um, import files here ready to go that um, is, it looks a lot like some of the things that we see pretty regularly in support as far as um, what some files may look like before they are cleaned up and ready to import into Bloomerang. And so this is gonna be an interactive experience. So um, tune in, <laughs> um, get get ready, because I'll, I'll need your help. Um, hey, I, real fast, I see this and I wanna answer this question. Chat support, totally free with every um, Bloomerang account. Um, just click the question mark up in the top right of your database and choose live chat online, and it'll connect you with uh, an agent as long as we're online, which is 9 to 8 Eastern, Monday through Friday. Um, thank you, Allison. We appreciate that. We try very hard. <laughs> so anyway, okay, let me let me reshare with this file here. Um, get ready to interact because I'm going to need y'all's help in cleaning this file up. Okay, so here is an example of a file. I've got chat and Q&A pulled up here for, um, for any interaction here. Here's an example of a constituent import file that maybe you have pulled down from a past CRM or a different sort of system um, that is you know, that's got the data in it that you need to clean up and get ready for Bloomerang. Um, so this file is got a lot of stuff going on in it. A lot of it is helpful, but some of it unfortunately isn't ready to be imported into Bloomerang. Um, so based on what y'all know about imports and what we've kind of gone over already, um, is there anything that jumps out to you as something that needs to be adjusted in this file before it'll be ready to import. Excellent, yes, it's tons of tons of names, um, examples flowing in, that's great. Yeah, I'm gonna show you that split text to column functionality now because that would be the best way to clean this up. As you can see, the names are in one column and they ought to be in more than one. So if you just select these, um, these cells here and go up to, data. I'm in sheets. Um, I imagine that the the process is very similar in Excel, but this is how it precisely works in sheets. Go to data, split text to columns. We're going to choose the separator as space. Actually, I, I did fail to do one step. The first thing you're going to do is create a new column. So it's got a place to go. And then we'll select these data split text to columns, we'll choose space as the separator. And now the system's gonna look for any space in here and split them in to separate columns. So then of course, we'll want to rename this one to first name and this one to last name. And boom, just like that, um, fixed. Let me scan through some of these and see anything else. Name should be split. Emails are all the same. Yeah. Normally, you're totally right. We would have unique emails for all of these. I just was not interested in <laughs> generating a fake email for each person. So you can assume that everyone here has a unique a unique email instead of just this test one. But great call out. Some zip codes need the leading zero, 100%. Yep, this is an instance of 
um, sheets doing the deal where we type in that leading zero for the zip code, we click enter and it pulls it away, right? So if you recall from our notes, if we hit an apostrophe and then put in the zero, it will retain that zero. So there's a nifty tip when wanting to make sure that our leading zeros stick. Very good. Somebody mentioned the spouse name. This is an interesting one, kind of a gotcha here. Um, if you'll recall, we're actually unable to create households or relationships via an import. It's possible maybe that they've got a custom field in the database for spouse, but um, not really best practice there as far as how to record that data. So we'll just re uh, remove this here and assume that when um, they have finished the import, they're going to set up those, um, those relationships later manually. Okay, scrolling down through. Great call with Streetline 2 as well. Yeah, this is um, not the way to format something like this with a second street line when doing an import. We're going to want that all in the same column. The easiest way to do this um, I have found is, you know, just to copy the data from street line two. And if you click in the cell and control enter, it hard line breaks, right? You can just paste it in like that, like so, to get it all in one line. And then we can remove this street line two column. Yep, great find. Home versus work, great call. Yes, this also, all of these contact information fields need a label, um, home, work, et cetera. So we're just gonna put home in all of these. Ah. Man, nothing more pressure packed than having to type in front of an audience. Like so, okay, I'm gonna keep scanning through. Good call on the household name, you're right. Imports don't create relationships. Um, if you're importing in um, a, a file that's going to update an existing household, you could update that household name field, but that's not really what we're doing here. So best to just delete that. Very good, scrolling through. Good call, Sarah, on missing first and last name. Yes, first and last name are required fields in an import. Um, and so these lines here missing the first and last name need a first and last name. Um, this, uh, if, if you, probably only few people will have noticed this, but I am a big fan of the TV show Survivor. Um, you know, been on forever great show and so all everybody in my file here are former survivors so i'll add a couple more in here um let's see so yes need those first and last names uh yes if there's a middle name field too definitely can put it in there um relationships yes that will be done on the back end working home uh, question about the portfolio manager field. I imagine that would be a custom field in your database. Yes, um, and, and it's a great segue into some of these other columns here. Um, these are all everything I to L, right, are not Bloomerang specific default fields. In fact, um, and so we'll imagine that these are custom fields in the database. I can even pop over into my demo here. Oh, I'm an admin, not my demo. Um, I'm going to stop my share for a minute just to log in. There we go. Cool. So if, if we've got custom fields, right, we can update or import into custom fields. Um, it's important, of course, to make sure that any fields that are in your file exist in your database first. Um, and so we'll 
having a hard time with this, <laughs> this Zoom window. Okay, so in our, um, our database or our um, sheet here, you can take a look at these columns and we're gonna scan our, um, our database custom fields to see if these fields exist. So we've got board member, lifetime revenue committees, campaigns. It looks like there's a field in here for board membership. It's a little bit different than um, the way that the field is set up in our file. Um, sorry, gang, this, the screen sharing toolbar is really in my way. There we go. So you can see the name of the field is board membership. Um, the values are current or former. And here we've got board member question mark with yes. So we're gonna wanna adjust this to line up with our database. So we'll just type in current here instead and paste that in. This lifetime revenue column is something we see from time to time and support folks wanting to import in some um, historical data like how much they have donated in their lifetime. This sort of um, use of data isn't really recommended. It would be better to import individual transactions, which will, of course, line up or add up to the amount that you're looking for here. So we're going to just remove this and trust that they may import the transactions specifically. I think I saw in the, the chat um, a call out regarding this committee's field yes this is a pick multiple custom field and so as we discussed we're going to want to use that pipe character rather than a comma here to separate those nifty thing regarding this is it actually doesn't matter with spacing we can either put spaces between the pipe and the values or we can not put spaces and it's going to work either way so that will have to be edited like that. And then similarly to that revenue um, column, this campaigns column is, is probably, I'd imagine, representing campaigns that this donor has given to in the past. A better way of going about that would be to import individual transactions with campaign data attached. Then you can, of course, report on the campaigns that this donor has given to um, in the past, rather than attaching it to their profile like this. So we'll delete that as well. Um, I'm just going to scan through really quickly and see if there's anything else that sticks out. It doesn't really seem like it. Diana's done a great job of keeping up on that too, which is great. Yeah, Tony, excellent call out. I was about to do that as the last thing here. The, um, the system is going to look to row one here as your column headers. So uh, it looks like they've got a sort of file name here in this first row instead. Um, that's going to cause some problems when we get to importing. So we will delete that row as well so that our column names are here in row one. Great call. That's something we see pretty commonly as well. Okay, I'm gonna do a quick spot check. I think we've pretty much done everything here. I've got my, um, yes, my edited one and it looks great. Um, okay, so now we're gonna move into actually running this import. So I'll show you in the database UI how an import is ran, what it looks like. Um, so first things first, of course, we've got to take our file here and export it as a CSV. So we're going to choose download and we're going to select it as a CSV file. That should trigger the download. And now we'll go into our database and actually run this import. Um, so if you go into this data tools area, that's where um, the import and this update transactions tool, which is a pretty new addition to Bloomerang live. Um, we're just going to focus on importing today. So if we click import, you're going to see a few things here. You're going to see your list of recently processed imports. So whenever you've ran an import in the past, your five most recent ones are going to show up here. You can see some details on that import. If you want to see the file that was imported and what was updated, 
Also, every time you run a new import, it will create a, um, a template for it. If you've got something like um, a file that's coming out of a different system that you're doing regularly as an import, setting that up as a template and just running it off the template will save you some time as you go. As you can see, this is <laughs> mostly for testing purposes based on these template names. Um, in this case, we're gonna start a new template though and a new import, so we'll click new up here. We're going to name this import, which will then be the name of the template as well. And now we're gonna choose what we're trying to import. So you can see the four types of imports here um, to select. This is a constituent import, right? We're importing um, constituent data. So we're going to select constituents. This is why we mentioned that we need to split up individuals and organizations. Here in this point, you're gonna select whether you've got individuals or organizations in our file. This is an individual import, so we're gonna select individual. And now we're gonna select the file. So we'll click here, it'll open up the, dial, uh, the dialog box, and we're going to select this one we just downloaded. Okay, and now step five and six in my mind are uh, the most important parts of the import and worth really paying attention to. Um, I always say to triple check it. Step five is where your mapping is set up. Now, if you have formatted your file perfectly, there should be nothing you have to do here, but still worth paying really close attention to this, um, this screen. Basically what's happening here is it's telling you how each column in your file is gonna map to Bloomerang. Um, you can see again, it's it's worth spot checking here. Okay, are all of my all of my columns represented in this mapping setup? And are all of them going where I want, right? It looks great here, but if you had to make any adjustments, you can click on any of these and change how the column is mapping to the system. Um, note that these required fields you can't remove, but any of these other ones you can remove if that data you don't actually want to be included in the import. Also worth taking a look here in the preview, we'll get a more robust preview here in a moment. Um, but over here in this panel, you can see how this data is gonna be imported into the constituents, right? You can see their names, their addresses, um, the type of data that is going in to their, um, their profile. Hi, Alex. Yes. Quick, quick question while we're on the screen. What Please. if it's not picking up a field or what if I have two emails, which one is gonna get marked as primary? Yeah, great question. So. If it's not picking up a field, something you can do is click this add another field button, right? Um, most likely what's happening is the system isn't recognizing one of the columns in your um, your file as a either a Bloomerang default field or as one of your custom fields. And you can manually map that as long as it has the correct type of data, right? So we can click add another field you can choose from any of these constituent fields, right? Which are either your default fields or your custom fields. We'll just pick one. Um, in this case, we've already mapped it, so it's not going to let us choose another one. But if we picked one that has not yet been mapped, you can then choose the column to map over to it. And then the second question was regarding email addresses, right? Um, the, the primary data is going to always be the one that was most recently um, edited or imported, right? Um, depending on, um, you know, the the way that you run an import, that sort of data um, you can kind of fine tune which one you want to be primary based on if you're um, trusting your file or your database. But in short, it's going to be the most recent data is going to be. Um, your primary one. So it's not automatically home or automatically work, for instance. Um, again, it's going to be the most recent one, and you can always go into um, a constituent profile too and, and adjust which um, which bit of data is the, the primary field. 
So let's move on now to step six. Um, once we have spot checked everything here and everything looks good, um, we can click next and it's gonna generate a preview. Depending on the size of your file, this can sometimes take a while and it's going to read out what's gonna happen here. Um, 19 new constituents will be added. We've got um, a bunch of new constituents to add in here. So that looks good. Um, if there were any issues with our file, it would report them here. Also, if we have any um, existing constituents in the file, it will show us how uh, many constituents will be updated as well. Um, so if we like, what we see here, we can click run. It's gonna really make sure we wanna do it because again, imports are tough to undo. There's no um, precise or immediate way to do that. So we really wanna make sure we'll click run. It's gonna process the import and it's done. We can now um, look through here and we'll see where, so for instance, Rob here is one of the people we just imported and you can see here they are with all of that data that we wanted to create on their profile. Um, somebody just asked about duplicates. That's a great question. Um, probably beyond the scope of today's um, particular academy class, but I do wanna show the, <laughs> the um, negative uh, repercussions of importing everyone with the same email is that if I go to my duplicate tool now, you're going to see that it's flagging a ton of potential duplicates, right? Um, if I were to go in here, this is the easiest way to handle your duplicates, right? Is to go through um, preview this data and merge or dismiss duplicates as necessary. I expected that this would happen because um, I put everyone in with the same email, so it's it's identifying them as potential duplicates. Um, but again, if you're if you're importing those with unique data, then shouldn't run into that problem. Um, okay, let's take a second here before we move on to this next type of import. Diana, was there anything um, further to be addressed from as far as you can see or um, any questions to address before we move on to the transactions? Quick question, um, can you update um, fields via imports? Um, we have a question here, can you add bulk info to info already updated? So if you had made, I'm interpreting this as, please collect, correct me, Julie, if this is not the right interpretation. If you've imported to a field before and you wanna update that, is that possible? Yes, yeah, for sure. Um, the, the great news about imports is as long as Again, we've got enough matching criteria for the system to pick up um, this data as um, data that should map to an existing one. You can update that information on constituents um, at any point, even if you've you've updated it before. Great. And I know we're going to be heading into a donation import. Do I have to import the constituents first and then the donations, or can I do that in the same file? Excellent question and an excellent segue, <laughs> whether you meant for it to be or not. Um, yeah, you can go about it either way. Um, if you want to create your constituents first and then do a transactions import later, you're certainly um, able to do that. But the great news about um, a transaction import or even interactions and notes import, right, is that um, they need that constituent um, required fields in there as well. And so whenever you're importing donations, for instance, it's gonna also um, either look for an existing constituent to map that onto or create a new one if there isn't enough data to map it onto an existing one. So if you're gathering donations from new constituents, you can include that constituent information along with your donation information. And that's gonna create both the constituents and the, the transactions on their timeline in that one import. Um, so it's really handy in that way. Great, let's move on to that, um, that transaction import then. So let's imagine, right, in this case, we've got 
um, a handful of donations from constituents, maybe from um, like an in-person event or, or another common way that we see um, a transaction import file, the origin of it is from like a transaction process or even something like Venmo or Stripe or whatever, right? Where you've got the, you're collecting donations in another platform and you wanna get that data into Bloomerang for your reporting purposes. So, so we've got this file here. We're gonna do the same exercise here. Um, is there anything that sticks out for y'all as something that would need to get cleaned up um, before this can be ran in. Okay, dates in consistent format is a good call, good find, but it actually doesn't matter. Um, the system is um, smart enough in most cases to identify um, where the the formatting is off, but it's a it's a great point um, to for safety's sake do this in the um, the suggested format. Um, you can see it here for uh, the birth date, but I'm gonna scroll down into our donations and go to date as well. And you'll see the month, month, date, date, year, 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 year. Um, again, safest to just update that to the suggested format. So great call. Um, though in most cases, like you can see, it's wanting to, um, to change that. So I'm just gonna change my number format to the date field that we like. Good call. Um, I'm gonna scroll back up. Split names, great call. Yes, we're running into the same situation here. Um, note that this donor field has both names in the same column. So again, we'll create a column to the right and we will do our split text workflow. Again, here is that if you need a refresher, we're gonna select everything. We're gonna do data, split text to columns. And here in the separator option, we are going to select space. And it's going to, yep, yeah, create separate columns for the first and last name. Comments field, yes, good call. Um, there's a, a few things going on here. Um, uh, first, before I move on, I wanna make sure to update these first and last name column headers. This comments field isn't something that is a Bloomerang default field, but something that we see pretty regularly, especially from other processors or things like Venmo, right? Um, the information typed in along with the donation, you might wanna import that. Um, the notes field is a great way to do that. Um, in fact, it's just note, but this will import those, um, those comments into the note field on the transaction. Another thing with this, and especially again, if you're coming from something like Venmo or Zelle or Cash App or whatever, um, that is a mobile-based payment processor, people may enter in emojis. Um, unfortunately, when you try to import an emoji, it locks the system up. Um, it doesn't know what to do with it. And so, especially if you're taking um, donations from a mobile source, really worth spot checking for any emoji characters. Um, Amber loves Rob, but we'll we'll just go analog here. AOL Instant Messenger era, less than three heart instead of the emoji heart to make sure that that makes its way in. Campaign, yes, good call here. So fund is a required field and we're missing fund. Um, campaign is a, a great bit of data to include in your imports if you've got that for campaigns, but we definitely need fund. So we're gonna go ahead and add another column here for fund and a few things to take note of here. One of course is that any of our funds and campaigns that we're importing into, have to exist in our database. So we're gonna quickly move back over here to our database. We're gonna go to settings and transactions and find our lists of funds and campaigns. Um, for ease here, I'm just gonna pick the same one for all of them. So we'll type in building fund, knowing that that is indeed one of our existing funds. 
and apply that to our donations. Again, fund is a required field campaign, not a required field, but valuable if we've got it. We do wanna make sure that these are existing campaigns in our system though. And it looks like they're not. So we're gonna to wanna to update these with a existing campaign in our database. And again, if we have the campaign, that's great. If we don't, no harm, no foul. We can still run the import. Good call, Michelle. Yes, we need a date in every one of these transactions. Dates are required fields. So we will make sure to include that. We covered funds, great question. Um, yeah, Jenna, good question. It doesn't matter where the names show up in your data or yeah, in your, in your file. Um, putting them up in front might make things easier for you, but um, it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and, and good call, Jenny, about the, um, the data here. If we've got all of this, you know, if we've got data on the constituents, um, namely contact information, great to include, especially if we're wanting to map this to existing constituents based on um, a match of information. If we don't have that though, it's okay. Um, we don't have to have that to run the import. Maybe in some cases, right, you're collecting donations in person from someone, they're just signing a thing um, and you're not getting all of that contact information, totally okay. We've addressed the fund. Um, do dollar amounts need to be in currency formatting? Good question. We'll um, consult our import fields handy um, resource here as well. You can see it's a free form amount. So again, not really, um, super important how exactly it's formatted. Um, in fact, having it just like this as a freeform text field is the best option. One thing we do wanna do though is change these fields from donation date. Whoa, full screen that. Just to date and donation amount just to amount so that those match the Bloomerang fields. I'm gonna kind of um, plow through the rest of these here. Um, we'll notice that um, so a couple things in tandem here. We'll notice that first name and last name is missing from a couple of these entries. Um, let's imagine, right, that these are um, anonymous donors, right? You get this money, you know, dropped off anonymously to you and you need to record that. You can see that we've got this anonymous custom field here. Um, we've got a, a really good resource on how to handle anonymous donors that goes over this in detail, but one of the, the ways to do that is through a custom field like this for anonymous question mark. Um, we'll pull open our transaction-based custom fields and see that indeed that does exist for us. Um, when we are using that sort of field, it's usually in tandem with a situation in which the donor wants to remain anonymous, but you actually do know where it came from, right? So let's imagine, um, oh, I've got to pull a survivor out of my head. Let's do Davey. I've been watching, um, re-watching David versus Goliath. Great season. Davey's one of the stars. Um, so in this case, the donation was from Davey, but he wants it to be an anonymous donation. So we'll use that anonymous tag here. In this one, let's say that we actually truly don't know where this donation came from, who gave it, um, in which case we recommend creating a constituent called anonymous donors. And we can tie that with that anonymous tag here if we'd like to, but in either case, we need a first name and a last name. Um, regarding this email field, this is going to have to be um, clarified as well. We'll type in home email. And a note here regarding recurring donations, we're unable to create recurring transactions through um, an import. We can only do one-time donations. So we're going to remove this. Um, if, they, if you wanted to create or log a recurring donation, for a constituent, best way to do that would be manually in your database, um, creating a new recurring donation that way. 
And I think that's pretty much it. Again, I'm going to spot check here, make sure I didn't miss anything. I think we're pretty much there. Going to quickly scroll through, see if there's anything else that is relevant. Yeah, again, Diana's totally covering this. This is great. Awesome. Okay, so I think we're pretty good to go here. We're going to do the same thing now and walk through the actual import of this. So we're going to take our transactions file. Again, we're going to download that CSV. Yeah, in the good call. In this case, um, this is going to be matched by a combination of name and one other bit of contact information. In this case, we've got email. So if any of these names and emails match, um, then it's going to map it onto the existing constituent. Otherwise, it's going to create a new one. So let's go in and create a new import like we did before. We're going to call this Academy Transactions. This time we're going to choose donations, right? Even though we've got constituent information, um, this is primarily a donation import, but there's donation information, so we need to choose donation. Again, we are selecting between individuals and orgs. Individuals is what we've got here. We're going to select our file. And now we're looking at step five again. Um, the, the nice thing here, especially when running an import to a timeline entry, right, is it's going to break down where our constituent and our donation fields are. This is going to look really similar to what we just saw, right, on the constituent side of things. Again, if um, our, our required fields are unable to be removed, the rest of them can be removed. And if you need to change the way that any of these map or add any additional fields, you can do so by adding the field, deleting it, or clicking on it to change where the mapping goes. But again, because we've done a great job of setting up these files to basically be good to go, um, not really anything we've got to do on this other than double check everything. You can again see how the constituent and the donation are going to be imported here in the preview. Note that we also have multiple donations from the same constituent in here, totally fine to do. We need to separate them onto separate lines like we have done here, um, but it's gonna import you know, these unique transactions to the same constituent, assuming there is matching information. And then we'll go to next. Again, we're gonna look at the preview um, and we've got new constituents and new donations to be added here. We will run that. Again, it's going to ask us if we really want to do it. And bingo, bango, bongo, our import is complete. Um, we can again check out some of these constituents in the back end to spot check. Uh, but I'm going to skip over that for now as we are starting to wind down on time. Um, let me go over a few best practices here as we wind down um, and, and kind of summarize what we've talked about here today. We've got um, a great list of import templates and a resource um, that are great starting points for your files, especially if you're starting with data from scratch rather than coming out of a different system. Those import templates are a great place to start um, linked here in the slides. Um, make sure that you're reviewing your and custom, uh, creating and reviewing your custom fields and values in your database before you run those imports. Again, we've got tons of great documentation on imports. Great to review that before you run the process. Um, as mentioned before, we skipped this step because the files were pretty small to begin with, but if you're importing a large file of data, Running a test or a sample of those first five rows is a great way to make sure that everything is importing like you would like. Um, and then after importing that test, of course, go through, spot check the constituents, make your adjustments as needed. And you know, in support 
We are always around nine to eight Eastern, Monday through Friday, always happy to help with imports, um, to review your files, to make sure that everything is looking good before you run the import. Um, to access your knowledge base and your support portal in your, in your database, it's again, in this question mark icon, choose help and videos to get to our knowledge base where you can find all these resources we referenced. Um, or if you'd like to chat with us, click that live chat online option, and that will connect you with an agent who is ready to help. Um, and I believe that's pretty much it. Um, thank you for hanging with me and um, yes, for braving the the doldrums of spreadsheets, <laughs> which can can be a scary place for us who are not so spreadsheet inclined. Um, yeah, thank you for your that, time. That's awesome, Alex. Before we go, can we quickly take a look at a constituent record that we imported to or created yeah. via import? Yeah, let's do that. Um, let's pull. I know we did Rob. So yes, once the import is ran, of course you can go into your data tools, right? And into your recently processed imports here, and you can either download the file that you ran or you can see these details, basically what was displayed to you in step six, right? Um, you can also, yeah, again, you'll want to, um, through the constituent search area, you can type in the name of one of your folks that you imported and boom, here is the constituent that we imported um, with that custom field data imported into their profile, um, their email and address and phone number added as well, right? So that data that we included lands right there on the profile. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you everyone for all of your wonderful questions. Yeah. I was also very impressed um, how you were able to help Alex clean up his files. And That's right. Putting, <laughs> putting that new newly learned information to use like the split text and the pipe as well. So thank you all of you for all of your great questions. Um, it really helps your questions really help us improve the classes because we want to find out from you what you need help with. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, any last word on imports to for our friends today, Alex? I think the the final takeaway, right, as we've mentioned a handful of times already, is, you know, when you're when you're ready to go, when you've got your file um, ready, or you need help making sure that it's fine tuned, we're in support, always here, ready and happy to help. Um, it, yeah, sending it our way to give it a once over um, is a great way to ensure that everything is good and ready to go, and you'll get you know the unique pleasure of getting to chat with our support, <laughs> support folks. So. Absolutely. Um, I think it bears repeating chat and email support is free. Yeah. Don't be shy about reaching out. We've helped customers where we've done a couple of back and forth um, looking at the files just because it really helps to have that second pair of eyes. And sometimes you'll find things you didn't see the first time around. And that's fine. That's why we're mm -hmm. here. So please, please don't be afraid to, re afraid to reach out. Um, thank you again. Um, I'm seeing some love for our support team. We'll make sure to pass <laughs> that along. Um, but thanks again for joining us today. We hope that you learned a lot and we hope that we see you in another Academy class soon. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.